Educational Communications and this station present Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman. On this series, we explore the effects of human influence on the Earth's ecosystems and discuss solutions to environmental problems which affect the quality of life on this planet. Environmental Directions gives you the kind of information you need to help you participate in decisions impacting your community, the nation, and the world. Now, here's your host, Nancy Perlman. Hello. For the next half hour, we're going to be talking about the many different kinds of habitats and wildlife in San Diego area of California with my guest, Diana Lindsay. She is president of Sunbelt Publications. She has authored over 10 books with numerous awards, including Metal Sculptures of Borrego Valley, Anza Borrego Desert Region, Guidebook to the State Park, Marshall South in Ghost Mountain Chronicles, An Experiment in Primitive Living. And she is co-editor of Coast to Cactus, The Canyoneer Trail Guide to San Diego Outdoors, Far More Than a Hiking Guide. She is also a former trustee and current canyoneer with the San Diego Natural History Museum. She has served as past president of the Anza Borrego Foundation and has received numerous awards, including being the recipient of the Medallion Award from the State of California for her volunteer work at Anza Borrego Desert State Park. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Oh, thank you very much. It's great to be here. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this guidebook. I just skimmed over the directions for turn left and right on this trail and that trail, but enjoyed seeing the beautiful, gorgeous pictures you had of the landscapes, of the views, and of the different wildlife species, whether or not they were birds or mammals or flowers or trees. It was a delight to learn about this area, which I think most people go down to San Diego, to the city, a border town with Mexico, might enjoy the oceans, but might not get inland to the many, many different kinds of places that they can enjoy the outdoors. You describe over nine habitats, including chaparral, grassland, riparian, mixed conifer forest, desert, coastal sage scrub, beach, salt marsh lagoons, and more. Could you tell us some highlights of each each of those places? Certainly. San Diego County is a very large county, so we're looking at a land mass of 2.8 million acres or 400 and 526 square miles. And within that area, then, there is also areas that are called land use, where there are cities and there's developments in there. So 25% or 700 and almost 40,000 acres are being used by people who are living there. And the nine habitats are within 75% of this county landmass, or 2.1 million acres is where you find these nine major habitats. Of that landmass at 75% where the habitats are located, the largest habitat is Chaparral. It is almost 32% of the entire area that is open for wilderness and hiking and outdoor areas. The next largest is the desert. So you've got chaparral and desert that basically are 50% of this land mass. And then it just drops down to the smallest area, which would be the beach and salt marsh and lagoon, which is only two-tenths of a percent of the land mass or 6,360 acres. But just to give you an example, what in these salt various habitats, one of them is called the beach salt marsh lagoon and within that you would typically see a lot of the birds that you find along the coast like the snowy clover you'd find the terns you find a lot of the california grunion so you find those kinds of things along the beach the next one moving a little further to the east would be the coastal sage scrub and in the coastal sage scrub you would find things like deer weeds and encelias and black sage buckwheat then we have a grass land. And the grasslands are located in the lower elevations of San Diego County's interior valleys, but they can go up to 4,000 feet in elevation. So you're going to see a lot of grasses like the California state grass, the purple needle grass, bunch grasses. If we go into the chaparral, which is our largest land mass, you are going to find just a variety of plants, typically plants that can really deal with fire very well. You've got chamise, mountain mahogany, manzanita. Moving into the oak 
woodlands. These are in the higher elevations, typically 1,500 to 4,500 feet in elevation. You, of course, would see all of the various oak trees and then birds that are associated with them that you find, like acorn woodpeckers, western scrub jays. You find California ground squirrels, typically in that area, who are looking for the nuts. Then you have riparian areas, and this is where there are water courses and there are plants that are water-loving, such as western cottonwoods, mule fat, western sycamores, freshwater marsh, montane meadows, vernal pools. We would find plants like cattails and bulrushes and flat hedges and blackbirds uh, would be found in this habitat. Then we have a mixed conifer forest, and this would contain some of our large conifers, the coulter pines, the jeffrey, single-leaf pinion, California black oak, also live oak. And then the last one, which would be the desert. And of course, the desert has very unique plants that are found there, the desert agave. We've got ocotillos. We've got just a lot of different colors that splash the landscape, the creosote bush. We have desert willows. And of course, the birds that are associated with it. The hummingbird can be in a variety of different habitats, but it's well known out in the desert areas, the roadrunner. So these are the kinds of plants and animals that you find in each of these various habitats that are found throughout the county. And I loved your descriptions in the book about these habitats, about the views, about the plants, the animals. There are numerous historic sites as well as areas for scientific research, including the Palomar Observatory. Right. The Palomar Observatory is a really special place. It was one of the earliest observatories built in an area where it could be free of a lot of disturbing city lights so that they could really observe the sky and it is currently open you just need to check on the hours for visitation but we have a lot of hikes that are in the area of the Palomar Mountain. Palomar Mountain itself is a California State Park so you do have to follow any rules or regulations that involve the California State Park system but it's a a wonderful area to visit. It has rich history. There is even a history about a slave that once settled in there and became very famous on Palomar our mountain, Nate Harrison, and you see the Nate Harrison Trail. So you have a lot of local, colorful local history that is in that area, too. Sometimes you describe the recovery of these habitats due to human intervention or to natural causes like fires. And you talked about the 2003 fire and which areas were recovering and which were not. Yeah, fires in an area is real interesting. The chaparral, on a regular basis, does burn. Those are plants that are designed to burn the underbrush because when the underbrush is burned away, then new seedlings can come up. And there are special plants, fire poppies and and others that come up only after a fire. But through human intervention and climate change, we have more fires than what are normal. So it is stressing our habitats very, very, very much. But we have also have areas that have been impacted by humans and probably the biggest impact are all the invasive plants that you do find a lot in in our hiking areas. You find pampas grass, you find arundo, ice plants. These are all introduced plants that actually begin to take over some of the native plants. Even the Mexican fan palm, that's not native, but it's planted in many yards and then begins to spread in other areas. So you have native plants that are being impacted by invasive plants that originally were introduced by human contact with the land. So these days, you know, we have to kind of look at how do we manage this? How do we take care of it? How we do fire management? So it's another thing to become more aware of this. And we do hope that this book does make everybody more aware that we have a very close relationship with nature and that we need to understand it in order to protect it. In your over 500 pages, Every page has a beautiful picture of the landscape, the hiking trails, and the different plants and animals that are found there. You have featured over 500 species, but there are plenty more, aren't there? Oh, absolutely. If we just look at plants alone, there are over 2,600 plant species that have been documented within San Diego County. This is pretty amazing, actually. If we look at the area being a biodiversity hotspot, and that contains 35% of 
the Earth's vertebrate animals. 35% of all the animals are found here in San Diego County and 44% of all the vascular plants in the world, despite covering only 1.4% of the Earth's surface in San Diego County. So it is considered a biodiversity hotspot. Just so you're aware of what we cover within this book, even though there are over 2,600 plants, we have full descriptions of the most common, rare, unusual ones that we want people to be aware of. 272 plants in this book. We have 105 birds that we describe in detail, 34 different mammals, 76 different invertebrates, 27 reptiles, amphibians, five fish, and even six algae, fungi, and bacteria that we're, that we're describing. So we have 525 species of animals in full description of those that are most likely to be seen within this biodiversity hotspot called San Diego County. Was there a plant or animal that you really wish you had more space to talk about? There is a Hermes copper butterfly. They're beautiful little butterfly and it's only found in San Diego. It's endemic. So we have some endemic species that are only found here. So we try to give as much room as we can to talk about them. San Diego County is really very special because it is considered one of the world's hot spots. And that hot spot means it's an area that is very diverse in the types of species found here, but at the same time, it has tremendous challenges because it is a popular place to live and work, and there is pressure on that environment for people wanting to live here, and that's a challenge to be able to preserve these hotspots. So it's a spot, one of the spots in the world that people are watching closely. It's very similar, actually, to South Africa. Interestingly enough, South Africa, Cape Town area, is on the same latitude to San Diego. It just happens to be south and we're north. And it is also a worldwide hotspot with a diverse population of species. What's interesting is that similar landscapes in other parts of the world, as you mentioned, South Africa, the plants and animals evolved similar adaptations, but they're separate species than what evolved here in California. Absolutely. You'll find very similar plants in those kinds of niches that are found there, habitats that are similar that have evolved, but they're a totally different genus, totally different species of animals. And that's another interesting thing to see how these things evolve in similar places around the world. One can go out into the out of doors by using your excellent book, Coast to Cactus, but one can also be led by a canyoneer and have the expertise of an expert who can point various plants and animals out. Absolutely. The canyoneers lead hikes from September through June all year long. Various habitats that we go into, they're absolutely free hikes. We encourage the public to join us on a walk. There are various lengths. You can go to the San Diego Natural History Museum website and look up Canyoneers. You'll see our complete schedule of hikes. And this is a great introduction if you haven't been into San Diego County areas to learn about the plants and animals and species, the culture, the history that is found there. So we highly encourage folks to join in on a hike or if they like to go out individually, pick up a copy of Coast to Cactus and pick an area out and go out and enjoy it yourself. We're going to talk more about the great outdoors of San Diego County in California when we return in a moment with my guest, Diana Lindsay. Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman continues with further discussion of the world's critical ecological issues. For more information, you may call 310-559- 9160 or go to www.ecoprojects.org. Now, here's Nancy. I'm speaking with Diana Lindsay. She is president of Sunbelt Publications and is co editor of Coast to Cactus The Canyoneer Trail Guide to San Diego Outdoors. The hiking guide part is interesting as well because you describe the various views that one can see. And of course, when you get into the mountains and the canyons, you have beautiful rock formations, you have beautiful landscapes to look at. Whenever you climb to a higher peak, you have incredible views. Of our mountain hikes, a lot of them have tremendous views that are out there. Of course, the coastal areas have beautiful views 
news also. We always try to give as much information as we can. And what we do on each of the hikes, each hike has what we call at a glance, just the facts. So at the top of every hike page, you'll see the distance, you'll see the difficulty, the elevation gain and loss, the hiking time, and more important than that, the agency who is responsible for that territory or that particular hike area, because each of the agencies do have rules and regulations that you must follow, and a lot of those have to do with, can you have dogs on the trail? Can you hike off trail? Can you have horses? What about four-wheel drive? And then we have notes that the hiker needs to be aware of if there's a visitor center, if there's no water available, you need to carry water, if there's no access during part of the year. We also gave a trailhead GPS to make it easier to find. We tell about what map, which USGS seven and a half minute quadrangle that you can use. And we also have what's called an Atlas Square, and that refers to to the San Diego Natural History Museum website where you can go and place an area that you're hiking in and it'll list all of the plants that are located there so that you can see in more detail what kinds of things you can find. And then we give full directions from both north, south, east, west, from wherever you're coming from to get to the trailhead. So that at a glance is full information. In addition to that, we have a full description of the trail the historical and cultural information, and then specific species information, and more important than that, the need for protection. It's kind of the philosophy that if we educate the public through education, people learn to love an area because they found out something special about it and they start paying attention to it. And once that happens, they begin to really like the area and love the area. And then when it comes time for preservation and protecting that area, those are the folks that are going to come out and say something and make sure that our particular biodiversity and this rich area that we have will be preserved because they will speak up. There's a very famous trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, that goes from Mexico to Canada. It, of course, goes through San Diego County. But there's also development of a trail going not just north to south, but east to west or west to east, depending. The Costa Crest Trail, yes, there are several long-distance trails and some that are still being developed. There's a trail along the San Diego River that is still being developed so that one day you can hike from the Salton Sea all the way to the Pacific Coast. Lands are being purchased from private landholders, especially the San Diego River Foundation works very closely with folks that are interested in that trail to open those areas up so that we can have an east to west trail. Most people are familiar with the north to south, the Pacific Crest Trail, and we do have hikes along the Pacific Crest Trail. You have been very active in working as a volunteer with the Anza Borrego Desert State Park. You've gotten awards for your work. You've also written a book about the Anza Borrego Desert Region and the State Park. The area is very special, one of the largest state parks in the country. Even though it's a desert, it's alive with plants and animals. Describe this unique place. A lot of people think it is just desert, but it's not because Anza Borrego State Park actually extends up into the Laguna Mountains. And we do have hikes up in the Laguna Mountains that are adjacent to Lake Cuyamaca. And it is part of Anza Borrego. So Anza Borrego can actually be hiked all year round. The park has elevations from almost, uh, you know, 6,000 feet to almost to below sea level. And because of that great elevation diversity, you have a tremendous amount of plants that are found at each of these elevations. You also have the largest running stream in San Diego County that is in Anza Borrego State Park, and that is Coyote Creek. So you have water, you have canyons filled with water. You have palm trees, native palms, the uh, the California fan palms. If you talk about Native Americans in this area, the Native Americans who lived in the desert had a much greater variety of foods that they could collect because there is more variety in the desert than there is in the mountains or the canyons or the seacoast. Of course, the Indians just didn't live in the desert. They moved around in collecting things seasonally. So in fall, they would head up 
toward the mountains, and they would be collecting acorns and pine nuts from the uh, the Laguna Mountains or areas where they could find those oak trees. And then in the winters, they would be down in spring. They would be down in the desert collecting those types of plants that you know went to flower and seed. I'm just looking at each page of this desert section, and again, your pictures as well as your descriptions are wonderful. Pictures are gorgeous. You've got the jackrabbit, the cottontail. You've got the verbena, desert sam verbena. You have the dune evening primrose. You have those California fan palms that you mentioned. There are waterfalls, beautiful rock formations. There are also orioles, as some of the birds, desert lavender, teddy bear choya. California barrel cactus, ocotillo, desert agave, mule deer, yucca, beautiful lookouts of the canyons, golden brush, the list goes on and on. It's amazing what you have described and shown. Do you have some favorite plants and animals in that desert that you want to make sure people are aware of? I always enjoy seeing the road runners. They're fun. Well, I certainly do, but I want to make one quick comment, too, about all of those beautiful pictures and the write-ups we have. We were for years and years on this book and carefully had all the scientists at the museum verify and check and make sure everything is accurate. The book is based on weekly columns that we wrote for the San Diego Reader and got permission to use all of those columns. As far as my favorite plant species, I always like the ocotillo. Whenever there is rain and the, the root systems are shallow and they're usually where there's water runoff and any time a rain, a little bit of rain comes, that plant will just green up 72 hours later and then as it starts getting dry those leaves will drop off and it'll look like a dead stick but it's very much alive because it has the ability to photosynthesize in the bark of the tree it continues to grow very slowly but then as soon as it has water it greens up for a little growth spurt and in spring it has the most beautiful red fluorescent flower uh, that comes out that attracts hummingbirds there's a very close relationship between the hummingbird and the ocotillo it's a slow grower so when you see these tall ocotillos they could be 100 150 years old the coastal hikes there are some very special areas such as the Torrey Pines, which is a unique species found only in that location. Absolutely. What we try to do in every single chapter of the book is not to repeat descriptions of the species that we are talking about. And this is a case where the index of the book becomes extremely important because the index has both the common name, scientific name of every single species. And in that index, there will be a bold, bold set of pages where you get the full description of that particular species. We also have charts with the nine habitats and all the species listing both by common name and scientific name. So you can look up a particular species, look on the chart, and you can see what habitat that species is found in. For instance, if you were wanting to take a look, let us say American avocet, a particular bird, well that's only found in a riparian area. So you'll only find that there. But then you can take a look at Anna's hummingbird, and you will find it in four different habitats. Certain birds are found in certain locations. For example, the egret or the heron are in the water areas. But then you go to the desert and to the mountains, and you'll find the California quail. And, of course, you'll find throughout the various canyons and grasslands, you'll find gnat catchers, you'll find various species from wobblers to so many of the what might be common species but also uncommon. Were you able to distinguish what unique species are found in this region, which are endemic and only found in the San Diego area? Absolutely. In the descriptive area, we tell if it's common, if it is an invasive plant, or if it is a uh, endemic to the area, or if it's a rare species. You mentioned exotic and invasive species that are not native to the area, and we're so familiar with the European honeybee, but there are bees that are 
solitary, local, adapted to certain plants in the areas, and they need protection. You know, it's interesting that you ask about bees. People have no idea how many bees there are really in the county. In the county, there's over 650 species of bees, and the honeybee is actually, as you mentioned, is an introduced species, so that is not a native bee, but we have many, many bees in the county, and when you look worldwide, there's many thousands of bees. As I look at the gorgeous flowers in different areas have different flowers the spiny red berry whether or not it's the lemonade berry you talk about some of the uses of these various plants and of course the flowers and seeds are very important to the various species whether or not it's the telegraph weed or whether or not it's the san diego mountain mahogany or the san diego wreath plant they're named for the area. Are they found only there? Some of them are within a particular habitat, but then habitats don't just kind of have a line and it changes suddenly. So there is a transitional zone between all of the habitats. The plants are there and their blooms are there because the plants can't move around and find a partner to mate with. So they use strategies with pollen to be able to pollinate another plant to to grow and flower and so what they have to do with their blooms is to attract certain birds certain insects certain animals and they reward them with a food or a nectar or something but as that animal or insect or bee goes into that plant gets pollen on them goes to the next one that's how they're able then to preserve the species because they can't just go around and pick a mate so they have these strategies and so these beautiful flowers that we see are really meant to attract certain types of animal species to that plant so that it can carry the pollen off to another plant and then be able to fertilize it. I found your descriptions really marvelous. They explained certain behaviors, certain ways that the animals live and feed and protect themselves. You've got everything from the big mammals like the bighorn sheep to the mountain lion, the bobcat, to the tiny insects which are fascinating, whether or not it's the funnel weaver spider or the trapdoor spider. And then of course the reptiles, the rattlesnakes, which we should be cautious of, but let them have their place to live, as well as you've got the iguanas, you have many different kinds of birds, as I was indicating, that are so numerous to mention. It's a bird lover's paradise. And of course, you've got the butterflies, which are always gorgeous to look at. Are there particular species that you want people to really watch out for when you're on the trail? Every trail has its own particular species. But one of the things that we'd like to do in teaching people about outdoors, we call them trail tales. It's to tell people or show people something unusual that it will help them remember that species. For instance, a lot of people see the monarch butterfly. But if you ask somebody, well, is that a male or is that a female? And actually, once you learn how to identify it, you can impress all your friends and saying, oh, that's a male butterfly, because it has very distinct two dots right on the back of its wing where the female does. And once you are aware of that, you can readily identify it that way. For instance, something like a dragonfly and a damselfly, they look very similar. They have a variety of colors, and you would think it's the same species, but it's not. It's actually in a different genus. You can tell them apart when they land because the female has its wings straight back like a gown. She's a damselfly, so she has a long flowing gown behind her. The dragonfly uh, has his wings folded when he lands. And the book is Coast to Cactus, the Canyoneer Trail Guide to San Diego Outdoors, far more than a hiking guide. And even if one doesn't go outside to use it in the field, one can lay back and be an adventurer by reading about these wonderful places, these wonderful wildlife species, these wonderful habitats. I want to thank you so very much for making this resource available. We 
we worked with more than just the San Diego Natural History Museum to develop this book. We worked with California State Parks. We worked with Mission Trails Regional Park, the San Diego River Park Joint Powers Authority, the San Diego River Park Foundation, and San Diego County Department of Parks and Recreation. So we worked closely. They checked everything for accuracy, and all of them endorsed this book highly. So this is the book that you can use if you really want to know about the species that are found here and the rich biodiversity that is found in San Diego County. Thank you for being my guest. Oh, you're very welcome. And you might let your guests also know that when they buy a copy of this book, 100% of the royalties from this book go to the San Diego Natural History Museum to support research. All of us canyoneers who wrote this book and worked on it for years and years, are not paid a penny for this book. Thank you so very much for your dedicated work. You're very welcome. I have been speaking with Diana Lindsay, president of Sunbelt Publications and author of numerous guidebooks and resource books about the San Diego area. I'm Nancy Perlman. Thank you very much for joining us, and do tune in again next week. If you would like free information about these environmental issues, go to www.ecoprojects.org or call 310-559-9160. Environmental Directions with your host, Nancy Perlman, is a community affairs program of the nonprofit organization Educational Communications and this station.